Good evening and welcome from New Canaan Library. I'm Anthony Maricola, Manager of Adult Services and Programming. Uh, I hope everybody is doing well. We have a really great program for you this evening. Tonight, Roger Lowenstein will discuss his book, Ways and Means, Lincoln and His Cabinet and the Financing of the Civil War. Ways and Means reveals a largely untold story of how Lincoln used the urgency of the Civil War to transform a union of states into a nation. Roger Lowenstein has written numerous critically acclaimed books, including the New York Times bestseller, Buffett, When Genius Failed, and The End of Wall Street. He has three children and lives with his wife, Judy Slovin, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Tenants Harbor, Maine. Thank you so much for being with us, Roger. Uh, Tony, thank you. Uh, uh, it's really a pleasure to be speaking to the New Canaan Library, at least virtually, as I mentioned to you uh, uh, just before. I grew up in Larchmont, uh, just uh, down the road. So um, uh, a virtual hello to all and uh, hoping that a physical hello will follow in uh, uh, not too much time. So the, the thesis of the book uh, is that the American public has largely overlooked uh, the revolution that occurred in, uh, in the American government during the Civil War. And that the, the great changes had as much to do, the great political and economic changes, had as much to do with determining the winner of the war uh, as the Union's uh, obviously superior uh, uh, population and, and battlefield strength and all of that. I, I think few uh, people today uh, realize uh, the, the, uh, all that the Union government accomplished or the immense challenges uh, that, uh, that faced the Union. Uh, many of these were financial, not all financial, but uh, as Lincoln recognized, uh, the finance was particularly important because if he didn't get that right, uh, they might have lost the war and then you know, nothing else uh, would have mattered or, or, or would have happened. Uh, you may not know that for most of his career, Abraham Lincoln actually focused on economic issues. And that's because uh, the, the country he came from, uh, what was then called the West, uh, today we'd call it the Midwest, Kentucky, uh, Indiana, Illinois, uh, was remote. Uh, it didn't have the resources that people needed and the first needs of politicians uh, were economic. Uh, they were the first needs of, of Lincoln himself. There weren't uh, roads, uh, there weren't uh, canals, certainly were no uh, railroads. There wasn't enough uh, money in circulation. Uh, Lincoln clerked for a store briefly, and as he said, the store winked out. Uh, there wasn't credit or, or, or much in the way of uh, banks in the area. And so uh, Lincoln took tremendous uh, interest in these issues, uh, even as he himself became uh, a prosperous, I, I wouldn't say uh, rich, but, but a prosperous lawyer, self-taught, self obviously. Uh, the interesting thing with Lincoln is that although like, like many self-made men, he took great pride in that, uh, he respected, he said, uh, more than anyone else, someone who worked his way up from poverty. Uh, he believed in the American dream. He said it was good that uh, some people were rich. It showed that other people uh, could become rich. But, and it's a very big but, uh, he also believed that government should help those uh, who had started uh, on the bottom of the economic ladder. So uh, unlike many, I think, uh, self-made men, he thought that, that this was a vital purpose of government. Uh, to help people, to create opportunities for people uh, like himself, uh, who'd started at the bottom. Uh, he ran for the Illinois legislature, first time in 1832, at the tender age of 23. He lost, but he won uh, two years later. And his, um, his issues in that campaign were uh, uh, starting a central bank, uh, roads and uh, infrastructure, uh, sort of the build back uh, better of the day, and the tariff. And he stuck with those issues for 20 years. And they were all issues, uh, at least as he, as he saw it, and as his then Whig party saw it, that would help uh, uh, build up the prosperity of the back country, increase trade, allow it to trade uh, more with the East, transportation, compete against Europe and so on, more schooling. Uh, Lincoln himself had, had only, as he put it, um, went to school by littles, uh, less than a year overall. And all these issues uh, that would bring the, uh, the western part of the country uh, into the economic marketplace of, of the prosperous East. That was really what Lincoln uh, paid attention to. He, he always abhorred slavery, uh, absolutely abhorred it, but that wasn't his focus, uh, at least until it became uh, the focus of the country, uh, which of course was in the 1850s. And even then, um, uh, Lincoln had to be careful uh, how he treaded on the slavery issue, uh, basically because he was uh, running for office in Illinois and you couldn't then, if you wanted a future in politics, uh, get too far ahout, uh, ahead of the people, uh, the voters. Uh, it was not an abolitionist uh, electorate in, uh, in Illinois, uh, nor was it in most of the Northern states, but certainly not in Illinois. In that famous uh, uh, election of 1858, 
uh, against Stephen Douglas for the Senate. Uh, Douglas actually tried to bait him uh, and to get uh, Lincoln to sign on to things that, that Douglas could say were uh, in favor of racial mixing, which was, which was a real slur term back then. But Lincoln didn't take the bait. Uh, he didn't espouse uh, social equality for African-Americans, uh, something that may uh, trouble us today. In this election, he didn't. Uh, he didn't espouse uh, the franchise, the vote for all African-Americans then. But he did do something else. He supported the rights of the black man uh, and woman as economic actors, as economic agents. He said, and he said this in the first Douglas debate in Ottawa, uh, Illinois in 1858, he said, in the right to eat the bread, which his own hand, his own hand earns, the black man is my equal and the equal of Judge Douglas and the equal of every living man. And this was quite a forward thing to say if you were running for office in, uh, in 1858. And he said the same thing when he was running for president, uh, particularly just up the road from where you are in New Haven in 1860. Uh, Lincoln said that he believed in opportunity, that every man should have the right to rise. And he added pointedly, and I believe the black man is entitled to it. So even when it came to slavery, uh, Lincoln tended to frame these issues in economic terms. Had there been no war, I think his agenda would have been uh, very much the same. It would have been promoting the government as the engine of opportunity, uh, the, the, uh, the engine that could make the American experiment in democracy really the, the model of the world. That's really why Lincoln was so attached to American democracy. But of course, there was a war. And even before it started, Lincoln realized that the finances uh, would be key. Uh, as he said uh, at the very beginning, uh, the side with the most resources would win. Even before he became president, after his election, on, uh, on New Year's uh, Eve, 1860, uh, he telegraphed uh, Salmon Chase, uh, an Ohio politician, uh, actually fervent uh, abolitionist, uh, inviting him out to Springfield because Lincoln knew that he needed a very strong uh, uh, Secretary of the Treasury, a very key post, and invited Savin Chase uh, to come to visit him in, in Springfield. And, and this turned out to be a pretty interesting visit. Uh, Chase uh, knew nothing about uh, finance, uh, much less than Lincoln. As I say, he had focused in the, the, his antebellum career as a senator and governor of Ohio on anti-slavery issues. Uh, Chase was very ambitious. Uh, he was one of those rivals, as, uh, as uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin called them, who had run against Lincoln for president in 1860. But but Lincoln had, of course, taken the Republican nomination, won the, the presidency. Uh, but he was considered uh, one of the greatest minds that, uh, that the Republicans had. And so uh, Chase uh, took a few railroads. You had to take various railroads back then to, to get from one part of the country uh, to another, uh, to Springfield. And when he, got to, uh, when he got to Springfield, he dropped his card, uh, uh, sent his card over to, uh, to Lincoln's home saying that he'd arrived at his hotel, gave the name of his hotel, and said that when he'd rested up, uh, he would call on the, the president-elect. Well, Lincoln, being a, a very informal uh, a prairie uh, lawyer, as you, you've read about, uh, bounded over to Chase's hotel immediately uh, with all of his uh, uh, back-slapping uh, reverie and introduces himself. Uh, Chase is a little bit uh, put off. He finds this a little bit undignified, uh, maybe a tad uh, 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 lacking in respect. Um, Lincoln says, um, right off, I've called for you uh, to ask if you will accept the post of Secretary of the Treasury uh, without exactly being able to offer it, however. And the however was because Lincoln's campaign managers had promised a position to somebody else, to someone from Pennsylvania, a state that had been key to his uh, election. And so Lincoln had to deal with the, the politics first, but he wanted Chase at least to sign on. Well, this was sort of the second uh, uh, stroke uh, against him. Chase hadn't come, at least in his mind, uh, all the way to Illinois uh, uh, just to be uh, just to sign on to a position that wasn't there yet. Uh, this uh, sort of awkwardness uh, sort of defined uh, the relationship between uh, Lincoln and Chase. In some respects, they had a lot uh, in common. Uh, Chase had also grown up in impoverished circumstances, but unlike Lincoln, he'd been born. Uh, to a pro prosperous family. His father had died after that, things have been tougher. And uh, there's a sense in Sam and Chase that um, uh, I think he resented uh, his fall from privilege and uh, didn't want his back slapped so readily by, uh, by a fellow like uh, 
Abe Lincoln. In any case, uh, after Lincoln was inaugurated on March 4th, uh, uh, the day after he summoned Chase and said, okay, I've got the, the political issue squared away. Now I can offer you uh, the job of Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, Chase uh, immediately says, well, I, I don't know. I have to think about this. He's not going to be, you know, he, he's not going to be so easy to get. But Lincoln just uh, sends his, his name up. Uh, uh, he, he's not going to have, uh, he's not going to take any uh, of that sort of uh, behavior. But, but again, um, this, this sort of awkwardness uh, uh, sets the tone for their relationship. Uh, Chase still resented the fact that Lincoln had won the election and not he. As he uh, settles into office, he begins to um, uh, deliver some little pinpricks uh, uh, to Lincoln. Uh, after the Battle of Bull Run, which of course is a tremendous uh, defeat for the Union, uh, Chase sends a note saying it was really the administration, uh, uh, not a military defeat, uh, taking a dead aim at, at his boss at, at Lincoln. Uh, every so often he'll read an article uh, critical of Lincoln and Chase will be kind enough uh, to clip it and send it uh, to Lincoln, sometimes adding the words, there is too much truth in this. Uh, uh, when, uh, when Chase, uh, uh, when, at one point he sent a note to Lincoln saying um, he had just sold some bonds, he's the Secretary of the Treasury, he says, I know you'll be gratified uh, to, to see the low interest rate I arranged. Um, when no word of presidential gratification arrives, uh, Chase begins uh, uh, to fume. Uh, every so often, he just can't uh, take his, uh, his second position and what he, he sees as, as Lincoln's lack of respect, although Lincoln was actually quite respectful of Chase. In fact, he was so respectful of Chase that he tended to leave him alone, uh, which Chase misinterpreted. But every so often when Chase couldn't stand it anymore, uh, he, would, he would throw um, a little fit and resign. And Lincoln would have to go over and, and convince him not to. It was always Lincoln going over uh, and, and humbling himself, pleading with Chase to stay on. At one point, uh, on one of these occasions, he goes over uh, with one arm. Uh, he hands Chase uh, uh, the resignation letter. With Lincoln's other arm, that long arm of his, he, he wraps it around Chase and he says, now Chase, here's a piece of paper I want nothing to do with. Take it back and be reasonable. Now, why did Lincoln put up with, with all of this from, from Chase? And the reason quite simply is he needed, he needed a brilliant general uh, on the economic front. Every, every bit as much as he needed, uh, he needed a Grant and a Sherman on the military front. And I can give you an idea of the challenges uh, facing uh, Chase quite easily. Uh, in, in all wars up to that point, the United States had financed these wars by borrowing gold from banks. The wars tended to be short, they tended to be small, and that's exactly what uh, Lincoln and Chase expected for the Civil War. Uh, but as the war uh, begins to go on, Chase realizes he'll need more. So he goes to the banks of Boston, Philadelphia, New York, the main banks in the East Coast, and he asks for what is then the astounding sum of 50 million uh, in gold. It, it, it's almost all the gold that the, that the banks have. First, the, the, they say we'd be a lot more comfortable lending you paper. No, Chase, Chase is a stubborn guy. He wants gold. They don't know if they can come up with 50 million, but they finally do it. And they, uh, they have a celebratory dinner in Washington at Willard Hotel in Washington. A lot of the action in this book takes place in and around the Willard Hotel in, in Washington, a, a, a famous political watering hole of the day. Anyway, they have this dinner. And one of the bankers, the lead banker, gets up and says, Mr. Secretary, you've just borrowed from us the astounding sum of $50 million. That should be quite enough to fight your war. Don't come back. Well, I have to tell you that before the war was over, the United States would spend that sum 60 times over, 60 times over. And that begins to suggest the, the frightful challenge, the completely unprecedented challenge. The banks were tapped out. They had no more gold. Quite uh, soon after that dinner, they officially closed the gold window as the expression uh, went. And so Chase had the challenge, what is he, what is he going to do? And he, he really has four uh, arrows in his quiver that he comes up with um, uh, one after another. And I'll go after them uh, uh, quickly. One is, is what we today know as, as greenbacks. Greenbacks were paper money uh, they, they were official money in the United States, uh, but, but, but they were money and they were paper and that had never existed before. But until this moment, the only money were gold and silver and there were notes backed by gold and silver. But 
once the banks closed up, there wasn't enough gold and silver to fight the war. So Chase and the Congress inaugurated the greenback, a new currency that they would use uh, to fight the war. And this was quite uh, not only astounding to people, but horrific to people, even to Republicans. Uh, they thought there was something immoral in calling paper money. Uh, one of them said, one of the congressmen had written before, uh, shortly before the Civil War, uh, paper is no more money uh, than a contract to deliver flour is flour itself. Paper is just the promise of money. The, the real thing has got to be the metal. But Chase embarked on this experiment because he needed a, a currency and he needed it quickly. And that was first. The second thing he did, even more important or just as important, I think, as the greenback, and the greenback is the forerunner of the, of the paper money we use today, was Chase and Congress again, but, but really uh, Congress at Chase's pleading, inaugurated a taxing system. We had never had a system of taxation. The United States, as you'll remember from your revolutionary history days, uh, was founded in, in its uh, dislike, its, its uh, profound dislike of taxes. Since then, the only taxes had been tariffs uh, on the ports, customs duties. But uh, Chase realized the United States needed more. We needed taxes on income, on various professions. As a, a con contemporary said, everything under the sun will be taxed. And somebody, uh, another contemporary added everything uh, on the earth and under the earth. It was a, it was a very intrusive taxing system. Uh, the United States would send uh, tax assessors to homes and businesses around the country, around the North. Uh, they followed up by tax collectors. But the, the collection of taxes meant that this new currency, the greenback, wasn't really just paper because it was backed by the productive power, the earning power of the United States, by the income of all those uh, uh, wage earners and companies and factories in the United States. It was a profound uh, revolution in government finance. Uh, England had toyed with the taxation system. This was by far the most advanced. It happened dead smack in the middle of the war in 1862. The, the taxing uh, enabled the North to do uh, something even more consequential for the war. It enabled them to sell bonds. Uh, why? Because uh, people don't want a loan to someone they think might be a bankrupt. And that was really what people feared the, the United States government was at the outbreak of the war. In fact, the US government was paying 12% for credit uh, before the war, uh, uh, really a high rate. And they couldn't even borrow that much at, at that rate. Once uh, the taxing system was established, and creditors realized that there was real money behind the government, they began to lend. And with the help of Jay Cook, uh, the financier with whom uh, Chase founded a partnership, the union began to borrow uh, hundreds of millions and then actually billions in taxes, uh, sums that the, the Confederacy could only dream of and did dream of, uh, but, but could never match. And this really gave um, the union just, um, uh, just an unmatchable advantage in, uh, in the ability to raise feed troops, uh, supply uh, munitions, and, and so on. And the fourth step was Chase created a, a national banking system, a system of banks, instead of using, as the United States had had before the war, a different, a different currency, a different type of money for every state would all have the same type of currency. And this was, the, the national banking system is best explained as a system that would bring the modern financial era, not just to wartime finance, but to the country beyond the war and carry the U.S. Uh, all the way to the 20th century uh, and to, uh, to World War I. It really enabled uh, the United States to compete uh, financially in international terms uh, with Great Britain, uh, Germany, and, uh, and France. Um, as I said, though, the, 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 uh, these, as profound as these changes were, uh, Lincoln didn't stop with, uh, with only economic changes. And it, actually, in his very first address to Congress, which was on July 4th, uh, 1861. He'd called a special session of Congress in uh, for the precise reason of raising money and men. Uh, he nonetheless took a pause to remind the Congress and remind the American people uh, why they were fighting. And he said uh, it was because of the uh, primary object of government was to elevate the condition of men. And he specifically meant the living standards, the economic standing. Uh, that again was why um, Lincoln had gone into government because he thought a democracy could do this better than any other uh, form of government. And so he said uh, to the Congress, and in the months after that, uh, when the Congress came back for its regular session, 
at the end of 1861 and uh, on into 1862, uh, Congress at the, at the administration's bidding approved a series of bills that I really think deserve comparison with the uh, New Deal legislation, uh, much better known New Deal legislation of, uh, of the 1930s. Uh, the first is the Homestead Act, which had been proposed under Buchanan, actually passed under Buchanan, but vetoed, which was a piece of uh, progressive, uh, uh, really income sharing. It distributed uh, acreage to any farmer who would uh, go out, claim it and uh, farm it and improve it, 160 acres for, for uh, five years. It was a tremendous uh, uh, experiment really, telling anybody who wanted to, that if they went out and farmed uh, undeveloped land, uh, they could uh, have it uh, for free. Uh, after the Homestead Act, uh, Lincoln uh, legislated one of the most profound uh, infrastructure bills in American history, even to this day. And that, of course, was the Transcontinental Railroad. This stitched the country together uh, physically. It made it meant that we were really one commercial market. If you had goods on the West Coast, you could ship them east and vice versa and so on. And I think just as importantly, it stitched the country together uh, physically. Uh, after all, there was there was no uh, white civilization uh, between uh, Kansas, Nebraska, and the far west. Uh, there was no commerce, uh, there were no roads, uh, none of that. Uh, there was actually a fear that California would secede from the Union once the South did. Once the railroad was built, uh, we were clearly going to be uh, one country, uh, one uh, connected country, and uh, remain that way. And, and this had a tremendous difference it made in how Americans thought of, uh, of their own uh, country. Uh, there were other bills. Uh, the first Immigration Act, Lincoln felt very strongly that the economy should continue to grow during the war. And the Immigration Act was specifically uh, conceived to bring foreigners over so that uh, they could replace all the places of the men who were often uh, at war in the factories, in the fields, and so on. Uh, the Union passed the first, the, the forerunner of uh, the National Parks uh, system began in, in the Civil War. Uh, same thing with the National Sciences Foundation. For the first time, the government took up the cause of, of backing the exploration uh, of scientific know-how, uh, something that we're still uh, doing today. Uh, one uh, rather amazing bill, I think, was the Moral Land Grant College Bill. For any of you who went to a land grant college, you may know that it started uh, in 1862. What's so amazing about this bill is it uh, it put the federal government in the business of donating land to the states, which would be used to, to found colleges. They wouldn't be uh, uh, the type of colleges that then were prevalent, Ivy League colleges that taught theology and a little bit of medicine and so on, Greek and Latin. These were going to be middle-class colleges for the middle class, uh, teaching the professions, uh, mechanical arts, engineering, that sort of thing. You have to remember that not only was college completely foreign, uh, to most Americans. Most Americans at the time hadn't graduated from high school. And so here was the federal government legislating an act uh, to send uh, ordinary, that is to say, middle-class Americans uh, to college. Really, I think, an extraordinarily uh, farsightful piece of legislation. And, and the land-grant colleges are still, I think, the backbone of uh, middle-class uh, higher uh, education today. One other uh, uh, bill that was a favorite of Lincoln was the Department of Agriculture. Uh, Lincoln loved this bill. Uh, he knew how hard it was to be a farmer uh, out in the remote, uh, the remote part of the country. Uh, this, uh, the, the bill to create the agriculture department was going to disperse seeds and agricult agricultural know-how to farmers. It wasn't so needed in the East where farmers lived closer to towns, closer to each other. They were more in touch uh, with the latest in agricultural science. But as Lincoln knew, uh, that wasn't the case in places like uh, Kentucky or Illinois. And so that also passed in 1862. I'd like to contrast um, his attitude towards the Department of Agriculture. Uh, Lincoln, by the way, he, he called it the People's Department because he thought it would have a, an intimate relationship with individual farmers. Uh, I'd like to contrast uh, his attitude uh, towards the Agriculture Department with his fellow Kentuckian, uh, Jefferson Davis. Davis, of course, the later... Um, uh, president of the Confederacy. He'd been born in Kentucky like Lincoln, uh, just a year before Lincoln, only 100 miles away, uh, also in a log cabin. It was a, it was a slightly better uh, outfitted uh, log cabin, but it was a log cabin. But of course, Jefferson Davis took a very different path. 
Uh, his family moved south. Uh, they became uh, wealthy planters. His brother set him up with a cotton plantation in Mississippi, and he became one of the wealthiest uh, uh, plantation owners and slave owners uh, in the country. Uh, he became a senator from Mississippi. And when the Department of Agriculture was first proposed, it was before the Civil War broke out. Jefferson Davis was still in the Senate. And what he said then was, and he was really uh, largely responsible for killing it. He said, farming needs no teaching by Congress. Farming needs no teaching by Congress. And he was right. If your brother had given you a free plantation. Uh, I really think that the contrast really speaks volumes. Lincoln trying to uh, create opportunity for all Americans, eco economic opportunity for all Americans. Davis uh, worried about the economic situation of his class, the wealthy uh, planter uh, class. The, the, the dirty secret of the South and of the Confederacy uh, really wasn't how uh, awful slavery was, which it was uh, for African Americans. It wasn't a secret because that was pretty well known. The dirty secret was how bad Southern society, the slave-based society was, also for the poor whites who made up the majority of the white population. Uh, the Southerners, the Southern planters, like Jefferson Davis, did not want to raise the expectations of the poor whites. Of course, raising the expectations of the enslaved was out of the question, but nor did they want to raise the expectations of poor whites. They didn't want to offer uh, middle-class colleges or canals or a social mobility or education. In fact, the go a governor of Virginia, as far back as the 17th century said, I thank God, I thank God, he said, that there are no public schools in Virginia. And I hope he added, we do not have them for a uh, hundred years. So she something I think very profound about the mentality of the, uh, the planter class. It was very good for the Southern uh, cotton cartel, but, um, really not intended to, to work for anybody else. And so you might ask, well, why did people in the South uh, vote uh, for the Confederacy for, for, uh, to succeed? And the answer is they never did. Uh, the, the planters didn't dare uh, subject uh, secession to a popular vote, except in one state, in Texas. And all the rest, secession was decided on by convention, and the, the uh, conventions were stocked with uh, wealthy planters, with slave-owning uh, planters. It never would have passed a popular vote. Uh, for the reasons I went through. And at the time, the governor of, of, uh, of Georgia, uh, a guy named uh, Joseph Brown, made a very interesting comment. He said, the poor man's best government is slavery. The poor man's best government is slavery. Of course, he meant the poor white man's. But what he meant was, you don't need canals, you don't need roads, you don't need a modern uh, banking system. All you need is to be one rung in the pecking order uh, over those who aren't even legally uh, considered uh, citizens. Um, this, this notion uh, was not only cruel and economically uh, self-defeating, I think you can see that it was um, committed uh, uh, not to any, any notion of modernity as, as Lincoln's Republicans were, but to sort of a, a perpetuity uh, of an old uh, uh, backward system. The South didn't build up a, a taxing system, uh, the, the scant uh, taxing system they had, uh, they didn't even collect the taxes on, they didn't develop uh, industry or banking. I, I really think the South's uh, mentality uh, had a lot in common with that of, uh, of another tyrannical uh, cartel controlling country that we're reading a lot about today. Uh, if I can tax your, your powers of a metaphor for a moment, I was thinking of Russia's uh, Putin, uh, uh, just as, as I think Putin banked on his uh, oil cartel to allow him to have his way uh, in, the, in Eastern Europe. Uh, cotton was really the oil of the 19th uh, century. And just as Putin, I think, went into the war uh, with tremendous amount of, of overconfidence, uh, so did the South. You, you may have heard of, of the South Carolina Senator James Hammond's comment uh, in the, before the war, cotton is king, uh, no power on earth uh, uh, dares uh, to make war on us. Once the war started, the Southern Secretary of War uh, said, uh, was so, so confident, he said, if any blood is shed, he took out his handkerchief out of his pocket with a flourish, and he said, if any blood is shed, I will wipe it clean uh, with, with my handkerchief. Um, that's how uh, overconfident he was. Uh, the, the South actually, uh, one of the uh, Jefferson Davis advisors, 
proposed that they uh, they ship cotton to England, all the cotton they could. This is when the war broke out. The Union didn't have a blockade set up yet. Uh, that, that could have financed the war for many years. The, the South was so confident and overconfident of winning that they laughed this uh, proposal uh, off, uh, much, of course, to their um, uh, later chagrin. Um, ultimately, all they, the only industry they really had uh, besides the cotton was the printing press. And they were so reliant to the, on the printing press to print money. This was, this was they did for money that when in 1863, uh, the Union captured Vicksburg, and, and uh, which gave them total control of the Mississippi River and decided and, and divided the Confederacy in two. Uh, Jefferson Davis actually had a, a printing press shipped through the Gulf of Mexico to the other side of the, uh, of the Confederacy so that even in that, on both halves, they could go on uh, printing bills uh, uh, willy-nilly. And the, um, what happened is that oh, the Union experienced 80% uh, inflation during the war, it was serious inflation, but not any more than the U.S. Uh, suffered in either World War I or World War II. Uh, wars bring some amount of inflation. We're seeing that today in, in this country. It was certainly livable. Uh, the South uh, had inflation uh, of 9,000%. That's, that's a hard number to get your hands around, but if I could just take it down to sort of an everyday level. When the war started, uh, flour cost about $5.50 a barrel in the South. A year into the war, uh, it was up to uh, $38. Uh, a couple of years later, <clears throat> it had risen to $220. And by the end of, of the war, um, uh, 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 flour was $1,000 a barrel. Uh, well before that, uh, by, by sort of halfway through the war, uh, people were beginning to go hungry. There were bread riots in, the, in Richmond and other cities, but the one in, in Richmond was particularly telling, obviously, because it was the capital. Uh, and it was the women of, of Richmond who broke open uh, supply houses uh, some of them carrying uh, axes uh, because they were starving, uh, demanding uh, flour. Uh, obviously, when uh, your people are going hungry, uh, you can't uh, much longer uh, fight a war. And this ultimately uh, withered away the support of the Southern people and their ability uh, to fight the war itself. Uh, as a, uh, a Southern leader, who I quote, uh, said uh, very late in the war, uh, the Yankees didn't whip us on the battlefield. Uh, we were whipped in the Treasury Department. And so with that, I thank you very much. And I would love to take uh, questions. I understand from Tony that we have some questions. So far away. Sure. Thank you, Roger, for that. Um, just before we start, I'd like to mention that we do have um, your book in our in our library collection. And we, our local bookstore, Elm Street Books, um, also has copies for sale. Um, all right, so let's start. Um, so somebody had just put in a question um, and it says, if the South was so behind financially, why did it take a fairly long time for the North to begin turning the tide of the war? That's a, a, a really a good question. Uh, the South um, punched uh, uh, over its weight uh, militarily, uh, no, no doubt about it, certainly uh, at least until Grant uh, was finally brought East to, to run the, uh, the war effort. Uh, uh, they were, uh, I, I say in the book, they had just had this cussed, grim determination in the South. Uh, they realized, by the way, that the uh, financial front was the front of which they were losing. And they, the, their articles in the South, and the, both sides followed each other's prospects. Uh, every time the Salmon Chase passed another bill, they read about it in the South. They also read about the increasing inflation in the North. And you see Southern commentators saying, uh, we really need a, a Salmon Chase uh, in the South. Uh, what they also saw was once the greenback was approved, it began circulating uh, much uh, to, to the uh, uh, just fury of Jefferson Davis. It began circulating in the South because the, the uh, Northern troops would bring it in uh, areas in the South where they were occupying uh, border towns that would seep into the South proper uh, and because Southerners themselves recognized that their money wasn't as good as the uh, Northern money. But the, the, the reason is, is just that um, uh, uh, the, the North was um, sluggish. Uh, General McClellan, you, you may have read, was uh, very much afraid of, he, he was a terrific organizer, terrific driller. The troops loved him, loved him, but he was afraid to get, um, to go into battle. And um, the South uh, kept um, uh, enacting these diversions, taking uh, of the battle into the North, always briefly, but, but their idea was just to um, uh, make, kill the Northerners' will to fight. 
And, and that was their whole strategy. And, and, and they got fairly close to it. Thank you. Uh, somebody asked, was Salmon Chase affiliated with Chase Bank? Um, uh, not exactly, although it's not, it's not coincidental. The Chase Bank uh, was one of the uh, new national banks formed part of Chase's national banking system. It was formed about uh, uh, five or eight years or so after the war, and it was actually formed uh, just after Chase died. It was named after Chase in his memory. Thank you. Um, in your book, you say neither government had a financial system even marginally adequate to support a major conflict. Um, in addition to money, what else contributed to the funding of the war machine? Um, somebody also wrote in about war bonds. Well, um, you know, the, the war bonds, I mean, the, the, there were their greenbacks and the way the greenbacks work is the government could just give, give these out script. So uh, they gave these to the soldiers, they gave those to contractors, but uh, the North was very aware of the risk of inflation. This wasn't coincidence that they were able to avoid it. They had um, studied up, they, they knew what had happened in the Revolutionary War when uh, you know, the not worth a continental, the American co uh, currency was, became uh, worthless. Uh, same thing that happened in the French Revolution and so on. For that reason, they introduced the tax system. And then, and then as I think the question alluded to, uh, they began to sell war bonds. And although the banks were tapped out of gold, uh, the, the people weren't, and the, the American public really became, uh, uh, you know, a, a financial army. It was from them that the Chase was able to sell um, uh, several billions of, of war bonds. Um, somebody asked, did Lincoln see freeing the slaves as something that would be a benefit to the economy long term? And did the American people trust this vision? It's a very good uh, question. Um, Lincoln, uh, in the beginning of the war, uh, in, in the beginning of the war, there was uh, nobody talked about uh, freeing the slaves. In fact, the um, uh, the United States Congress passed a resolution dominated by Republicans affirming that uh, freeing the slaves was not the purpose uh, of the war. The, the longer the war uh, went on, uh, the more the Republicans became uncomfortable uh, with this idea. And, and, and the more you can see in Lincoln's writings that there had to be some greater purpose uh, uh, to the war. Uh, and that purpose uh, could only have been a slavery. But obviously by the second year, uh, he was uh, uh, planning the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, by the third year, uh, uh, he promulgated it. Uh, by the fourth year, they were on to the uh, 13th Amendment, which would guarantee abolition, not just in states under rebellion, uh, but permanently and, and across the country. Lincoln, however, had to address very strong um, anti-abolition uh, uh, currents in, in the United States in the North, and these were largely based. Uh, these were based on economic fears. The Democrats campaigned after the Emancipation Proclamation on the plank that uh, once there was uh, emancipation, uh, freed slaves would come north. Uh, they would take your jobs and so forth. Um, and this kind of race mongering was very common, and it led to the terrible riots uh, in uh, in New York City. Uh, that you may have heard about. They're, they're commonly known as the draft riots, but they were really race riots. Uh, 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 a dozen or so um, African-Americans, free African-Americans, you know, New Yorkers, uh, were lynched, were, were murdered. Uh, dozens of scores more were beat up just at, at random. Uh, and and uh, God knows how many were absolutely terrified. And they were all really whipped up uh, by uh, the Democrats, which of course were the, uh, the other uh, party then. Uh, pr promoting this idea that emancipation would be bad economically. And Lincoln uh, uh, took this on uh, head on. He gave a beautiful speech um, where he said that um, uh, there's this fear, and I'll, I'll get the words just about right, maybe not exactly right, but he said there's a fear that um, once there's uh, emancipation, uh, blacks will be uh, spread all over the land. And uh, he reminded uh, the American public in this uh, speech that Blacks were, as he said it, already in the land. They're already here, folks. Uh, they were already working. They might be working in different places after emancipation, more in the North, fewer in the South, but, but as he said then, uh, they are already uh, in the land. Uh, he he um, reacted with, uh, uh, he was terribly upset by, uh, by the race riots. Uh, he received a delegation of workers uh, from New York the following spring and referring as he called to the disturbances in your city, he said it, it, po it pitted one group of workers uh, against another. 
And he said it should never be so. Uh, Lincoln really believed that uh, uh, a government that created opportunity uh, would, would lift up all boats, and particularly all boats among the working and lower classes. And it horrified him to see uh, uh, ethnic groups uh, pitted against each other. In a way, this was a page from uh, the latter history of the ethnic rivalries, often uh, fueled by racism, that of course became quite common in uh, in inner cities in the north, in cities in the north, um, that that Lincoln had to deal with. Now, speaking on race, what impact did the remaking of the financial system have on indigenous people? Um, by indigenous people, I, I assume the question is referring to um, uh, to Native Americans. Is that yes. is that is that right? Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, I, I've I've been asked that, and the the the, the lands that were given out in the homestead lands were already um, owned by the federal government. So how the federal government got them, uh, some of them were taken from Native Americans in battle, uh, some of them by treaty and so on. There's a, that long history, but they were, the federal government already had uh, these lands, same as the land they gave out for the moral colleges and so on. Uh, so I've been asked, wasn't this, you know, sort of a, uh, an anti-Indigenous act? Um, I, I think if you um, if you want to point uh, to the uh, you know when did Native Americans lose their hold in the continent? Uh, it was much earlier than that. I, I think by 1860 uh, uh, there was an industrial civilization which had the kind of arms that was that did prevail and was going to prevail militarily over the Native American societies. Uh, did the uh, the railroad mean that the White uh, civilization settled uh, the Western states uh, more quickly. Yes, I think so. So it, it might have sped it up, but I, I, I sort of think the damage was done in the in the 17th century, in the early 18th century. Um, and one benefit, at least, is that because of the Civil War, uh, we had the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments, uh, guaranteeing equality and due process, so that uh, they they weren't officially extended to Native Americans until the 1920s, which is outrageous, but so that ultimately their descendants would be living in a country uh, with these protections. So one man's answer. Thank you. Um, somebody asked, what happened to the economy and wealth of the South directly after the war? Well, um, that's a sad story uh, for me anyway. Uh, there was no, um, uh, you know, great snapback. Uh, there was no uh, 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 peacetime miracle in the South. Uh, the South uh, was devastated, and the, the figures are all in the book at the epilogue. But it was it it was way poorer than it had been uh, uh, before the war. Uh, even forgetting the loss in their human property, uh, enslaved, but but loss of plantations, destruction, the loss of the industry and railroads they had, and in the uh, I go through it twenty, thirty, forty years, uh, they continued to lose ground. Uh, they never really began to make it up uh, until the 1960s. And I, I don't think that's a, a coincidence. The, um, the bad bargain that the South made with poor whites, the, you know, the, the poor man's best government is slavery idea, um, that continued to be the philosophy, I think, of, of the Jim Crow South, uh, particularly after Reconstruction ended from the 1880s or 90s on to the 1960s. Uh, that, uh, you know, keeping poor whites uh, satisfied by being one rung above. And it wasn't until uh, the 1960s in the great changes of the civil rights era that, um, that the New South began to emerge and we began to get uh, modern corporations and modern universities and uh, uh, sleek airports and, and, and all the rest. And the South began to join um, uh, the history that, uh, and the economic history uh, that they had missed for, for a full century and more. Uh, I, I say in the book that that uh, perhaps had the North tried not only uh, uh, reconstruction but also a Marshall Plan uh, for the losers, including the, the losing whites in the South, uh, something along the lines of what uh, was done for Germany uh, and other countries in Europe after World War II, to give them some stake in the, in the democratic alternative, which is what we wanted after World War II. Uh, maybe that would have um, induced Southerners um, to give Reconstruction uh, a longer look, uh, an idea that there was something in it for them. But anyway, that didn't happen. 
And, uh, and the short answer is uh, what was in store for the South after the war was, was economic disaster and for a long time. Yeah, and somebody else had uh, put a comment here, which tied into that a little bit. And it was well, it was a question: how how was the South integrated economically with the North post-war? Well, in the beginning, um, uh, well, the, 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 there was a, a resurrection of trade. So, uh, uh, in, in, in fact, uh, I should say one of the interesting um, elements of this, even during the war, there was a trade in cotton uh, as uh, as the North uh, captured areas like Memphis and so on. Uh, Lincoln and Chase uh, authorized, Congress authorized traders to go in and bring a uh, cotton out on, on the idea that it was only coming from loyal Southerners, which is a, a crazy idea. The generals hated it. Grant and Sherman were apoplectic, and I go into this uh, at some length, but it ties to, to this question. It tied to Lincoln's idea that we were one country. Uh, he said in his first inaugural, there's, there's no river or chain of mountains that could divide it, and he felt very much that that uh, secession uh, was just sort of an unnatural division, and that um, it it um, interrupted the uh, economic dream of the country moving forward. After the war, a trade, of course, resumed. Uh, the, the North continued to or, or resume buying uh, openly uh, uh, Southern uh, cotton. Uh, uh, there were moral colleges uh, built in the South, although of course they were segregated. And, and so that's where you got um, the string of, of very good black colleges because uh, under the Morrill Act, blacks had to be included, but of course the Southerners wouldn't include blacks in the same schools until uh, the, the 1960s. Uh, there was no, but, but um, if you look at uh, the amount of currency circulating in, uh, in the South, it was way, way under, I believe um, this is in the book, but there was more currency circulating uh, in New England uh, than in all the southern states. Uh, well, 40 years after after the end of the war, the amount of industry was was you know way before uh, the the extent to which the South continued to rely on farming, uh, continued long a majority of farming long long after the Civil War, and you know even even at the, by World War One, when the United States was was the largest economy basically on its industry, uh, the, the, the large cities. Uh, didn't rise up for for um, you know, at least several generations after the war. So the integration was very slow, uh, was, very, was very slow. So somebody asks, while the industrial North could obtain taxes easily, could the agricultural South do so equally easy? Well, that, that's a very good question. But the, the, so the South was always going to be challenged because uh, financially, because um, it didn't have uh, liquid capital. It's, it's much easier to turn industry into liquid capital uh, than, uh, than it is uh, agricultural goods. But the South did have some industry and they did have a tremendous agricultural product and they just refused to tax it. Uh, the, 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 their secretary, the, the treasury, a, a fellow named Memminger, pleaded with the government uh, to legislate taxes uh, and they wouldn't do it. And when they did do it, um, they insisted that collection be left to the states because they, they were founded on the state's rights a, a credo. And they thought a federal, a federal in, in Richmond, that, that federal, the Confederate federal government, to do that would be, would be contrary to the whole philosophy of the Confederate government. They had this idea, uh, Judah Benjamin did, as, as I said, to ship cotton to England early in the war and then just sell it off piecemeal as the war went on, uh, which could have financed a very low war. And, and they, were just, um, they were just too overconfident to do it. And they had one more uh, crack, uh, 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 bite at the apple. Uh, a, a European uh, bank offered them in 1863 to sell cotton bonds, uh, a fellow named Erlanger, uh, based in Paris. And the idea was uh, he would finance the South now uh, for cotton when the war ended. And this is exactly what the South needed because they had all this cotton, but they couldn't easily uh, get it to Europe until uh, after the war. Uh, but they needed the cash now to, to buy arms and other goods from uh, Europe. So Erlanger was, was proposing uh, to solve that problem by giving the cash now and, and to take the cotton uh, later. And the South, this is in April of 1863, they made an inexplicable mistake of refusing to borrow more than $15 million. The, 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 the man, Europe was just crazy for this deal. Uh, they could have subscribed five times as much, 75 million, because the, uh, they put a very favorable exchange rate of the cotton. 
So uh, Europeans uh, thought they would really make a bundle. All they have to do is uh, wait a year or so till the war uh, ended. Of course, they were just crazy to have subscribed for these bonds because once the war ended, A, uh, cotton wouldn't be worth so much. Uh, it was a scarcity value that was driving the price up. And B, what if the Confederacy lost? It would be, these bonds wouldn't be worth uh, anything, which is what happened. But, but, they, but they, they didn't quite realize that. Um, and the bonds were oversubscribed and the Confederacy um, uh, accepted only about 20% of what it could have raised. And this is really the last great financial opportunity they had. And after that, um, I think it really sealed their fate. Um, somebody asked, was Lehman Brothers neutral during the war or did it favor one side? Lehman Brothers was in the South. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, they, they look, all of the um, uh, people involved in shipping cotton in the South uh, wanted their society and civilization uh, uh, to continue. Uh, the uh, Judah Benjamin was a, uh, uh, I think, is a now uh, famous financier, partly because he was Jewish. Uh, he was offered a seat in the Supreme Court. He was from Louisiana. He was born in the in the islands, the Caribbean, but he, but he was raised in Louisiana. Uh, he was offered a Supreme Court seat before the war. He could have become the first uh, Jewish associate justice, but turned it down uh, to remain in the, the Louisiana in the United States Senate and to remain as a, a planter. Uh, and uh, when the war started, uh, a, an Ohio politician said that uh, Benjamin was an Israelite with Egyptian principles. Uh, so uh, uh, Egyptian principles, of course, being pro-slavery. Uh, so, uh, but the, the entire um, cotton industry, there, there were no, um, uh, uh, there were no anti-slavery um, industrialists or, or planters in the South uh, to speak of. Thank you. Are there any financial problems that we see in present day America that are a direct result of the Civil War? Well, um, uh, nothing I think is a direct result of something that happened 160 years ago. Um, but I think the problem of inflation, uh, you know, is in wartime inflation is one we're dealing with now. In the Civil War, as I mentioned, um, they were pretty courageous. They, they recognized that as, a popular, as unpopular as taxes are, uh, if you have great expense, you know, you need some proportionate amount of taxes to defray them. And they didn't, they didn't propose to, um, uh, to, to, to tax one for one. That's, that's why they had bond issues. But they realized that you, you had to have a much larger government and you had to finance the government with, with some real cash uh, if you wanted uh, to maintain your solvency. And I think that uh, in this recent period, uh, our government has been a, a little bit late uh, to concede that that uh, as our expenses are going up with the pandemic and so on, uh, and now war finance, um, you know, we have greater needs. And, and um, as unpopular as taxes are today, uh, it's better than seeing inflation go to uh, 9,000%, uh, as in the Confederacy. The other challenge, I think, is, um, uh, well, I, I think it too, I mean, the, the specific challenge of infrastructure. Uh, you know, the North, uh, the, the country had, want, had needed a... Uh, uh, a transcontinental railroad had been proposed for a decade before, but it had always been, uh, uh, they could never agree on it because the South and North couldn't agree on that or, or much of anything in the 1850s. Um, this was a, a tremendous thing. We have great uh, infrastructure needs in the country today on, uh, on broadband on, and on high-speed rail and, and, and many other things. So I, I, I think this is a, a good lesson. The more generic lesson, I think, is that uh, we had no central government to speak of uh, before the Civil War. Uh, we had a post office, uh, we had a string of forts, uh, mostly uh, in the West, and we had uh, customs officers collecting duties, and that was really it. And what the Lincoln government said was, no, actually you need the federal government to do a lot of these things. You need a federal taxation system. You need the federal government to institute um, uh, colleges and the Department of Agriculture and an immigration policy and so on. Um, as unpopular as it had been, they, they actually proposed in the North that the uh, taxes be collected by the states then too. And um, Thaddeus Stevens, a very biting and sarcastic representative from Pennsylvania, reacted um, very uh, savagely to this. He said, you know, when, when the United States had the Articles of Confederation in the very beginning, uh, right after the revolution, it failed mainly on account of this because there was no financial provision for the federal government. We're not gonna make that mistake again. And I think the lesson to be learned from the Civil War period is that um, 
you know, we can still use the federal government to do things. Maybe it's a national health care system uh, today and so on. But um, this um, this uh, extreme federalism that we see uh, sometimes, I, I think, uh, holds us back today as it, as it held us back in the 1850s. Wonderful. All right. So there's one last question. Um, let's see. We still have a few, but we'll pick one. Um, you know, Roger, you're known for writing very in-depth and well-researched books. Uh, Ways and Means is no different. How long did it take you to write this book? It took me about five years. Um, so the, the writing the book, uh, you know, you start going to libraries. And uh, I have to tell you, if you, if you walk into, uh, I, I live across the a few hundred yards from Harvard Square. If you walk into a wider library and you, you go to the Civil War section, of course, there are many sections, but just take one. Um, it's really enough to make you want to turn around and and, and, and give up the whole thing because it's the, there have been quite a few books written on the Civil War uh, over time. Uh, of course, you know I had a specific uh, uh, angle and slant on it. And but when you get through with with all the books you think might might help you in that library and other libraries, there are the um, unpublished collections of of letters and papers of of all these these figures, um, uh, starting with Lincoln's you know, wonderful uh, letters. And then you actually have to to write the book. Uh, so it it took um, it took about five years. Oh, wonderful. But I, I have to tell you, with a labor of love, to um, to be working, you know, in and amongst um, Abraham Lincoln, Savin Chase, uh, other great figures in in these great events, and and feeling, you know, that last question I think evoked some resonance of today. It was um, an experience I'm grateful for. Yeah, no, we can tell that you're very passionate um, and, and about this book, um, and it's it's been very popular. Um, Roger, it's been a pleasure. Um, thank you so much for spending your evening with us and discussing your book. I hope that um, in 2023 we can have you in person in our new library, um, and you could discuss you know all your work, uh, things that your 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 next project. Um, and I just I, we really appreciate you spending your evening with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Um, New Canaan community, thank you for spending your evening with us as well. Um, and I wish everybody a good night.